Madison Square Garden. Can't be it. In Muhammad Ali's case, he came back from defeat and reclaimed the world heavyweight title. That's one reason why he is, as he himself says, the greatest. Joe Lewis, no less formidable a champion, was also able to overcome the humiliation of bitter defeat and reclaim his rightful role as king of the ring. And now there's Mike Tyson, Iron Mike, unstoppable, invincible. And so he was until Saturday night, February 10th, when James Buster Douglas scored one of the greatest upsets in boxing history. The question is, can Tyson come back? Tonight, we'll explore the Boxing the at the foot of the Brooklyn Bridge. Welcome to another edition of Boxing the Sweet Science. Hello again, everyone. I'm Bruce Beck. Obviously, the major story in the sport of boxing, the swift and unexpected fall of former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson. We'll talk about what it means in the heavyweight division and for all of boxing. Also tonight, you'll meet the man who's the forgotten man in the Tyson camp, a gentleman who guided Mike during his formative years, trainer Teddy Atlas. And our own Iron Mike, Michael Katz, will weigh in to talk about the state of boxing today. And we'll have the latest highlights and news. Working with me, my broadcast partner and co-host of the Sweet Science, Gil Clancy. Gil, this was supposed to be a take-the-money-and-run show in Tokyo for Iron Mike Tyson. It didn't turn out that way, and that's not the Mike Tyson that I know. Well, you know, Bruce, you're talking about the Mike Tyson that was fighting every three or four weeks, an active guy that stayed in the gym. Now you have the new, new Mike Tyson burning the candle at both ends. The trainers let him do what he wants to do. He'd take off from training, go to L.A., come back, all those different things. They caught up with him all at once. One of the major criticisms of this fight centered around the corner, or the lack of the work in the corner. And what the heck was that bag they were holding over his eye anyway? Well, you know, Bruce, uh, before they had this end swell, this is the newest thing now. It's an ice-cold piece of metal that helps you put a swelling down. You take an eye like this, Bruce, this is ice-cold, and you just move that swelling away. Just move it away, you keep it on there, and you hope that you can control it. But even before they had the end swell, we used a tight ice bag. No, no uh, air, no water, and you could push it and use that pressure. These guys were using a balloon. It had no effect whatsoever. But you know what it is? They believed that he was eyeing Mike Tyson. I guess they didn't think he could get cut or hurt, and they weren't prepared. Now, while all this was going on in Tokyo, there was a lot of rumblings back home in New York, and one of the men that was making a lot of quotes was former Tyson trainer Kevin Rooney. Rooney's had his differences with Mike Tyson, but he welcomed Mike back with open arms to Catskill, New York. That's not Mike Tyson. That's not Mike Tyson. Let Kevin Rooney train Mike Tyson, and we beat Buster Douglas. Future's up to him. What does he want to do? MT should come home. He should come to this Catskill gym, and we should get back to business. Gil, we're going back to Kevin Rooney, straighten out Mike Tyson. Well, you know, boxing is a disciplined sport. Bruce, and I just don't know if anybody can discipline Mike Tyson. He's tasted that good life. A king has led him down a primrose path. Whether he's willing to make the sacrifice again remains to be seen. But all the great champions have lost and have come back, and some have come back better. Do you think that might happen? Well, if Mike Tyson has learned from this defeat, like, for example, uh, he didn't fall at the cornerman, that's great. You know, these guys may be good training another fighter. Maybe an Aaron Snowall can train somebody else. But with Mike, I think he's intimidated by Mike Tyson. Tyson has to accept the fact that these guys were not the solid pros that he should have in the corner. It doesn't seem to be that way. Maybe he didn't learn from this fight. Now, what about Buster Douglas? He's not getting much respect. We've gone four or five minutes into this show, and we've yet to talk about the undisputed world heavyweight champion. Well, Buster Douglas, Douglas is an enigma. He's always had a tremendous amount of talent. You remember when he fought Tony Tucker? He was winning fairly easily. All of a sudden, he collapsed in the 10th round, and his weight would fluctuate. He'd come in 260, next time 245. He just was never disciplined, and he just didn't have the desire. He seems to have found it all at once. He's always had the talent, and being the champion of the world, improves every fighter. We're going to see a new and better Buster Douglas. The major controversy in this fight, the eighth round, Mike Tyson knocks down Buster Douglas, the so-called long count. Don King convinces the WBA and the WBC so much that they even vacate the title for a short time. You know, people don't realize how that must have made Buster Douglas feel. He probably felt he got hit harder than by any punch that Mike Tyson threw. Must have been like getting hit right in the gut. One minute you're the champion, and because of these alphabets, you're no longer the champion of the world. But the general public wouldn't stand for it. I'm so glad that 
that. And these guys had to backtrack on their mistakes. It exposed them all for what they are. But when John Johnson, Buster Douglas's manager, first heard about the whole thing, he was livid. We won the fight against Andrew Holyfield and then fight Mike Tyson again. But I'll tell you what, they can forget it. They can forget it. They can go anywhere they want to go. I mean, who wants to pay to see Mike Tyson now? Especially because of this stuff. If he would have been a man, if Don King and them would have been a man and said, hey, he got beat, uh, you know, let's work out something so that they can fight again, then fine. You know, but they're taking that attitude, so to hell with them. Well, at least the sanctioning bodies came to their senses and recognized recognize James Buster Douglas as the world's heavyweight champion. But John Johnson was so incensed by Don King's tirade that now he says he's not going to give Tyson a rematch. He's going to fight a Vander Holyfield. Well, that was the promise that was made before the fight. Both guys said they'd fight Holyfield if they won. It fits in with the WBA, WBC rules. The only fly in the ointment is Don King's promotional contract. He says he's going to protect his rights, and I think he will. I just don't know what's going to happen. But the one thing I do know, the fight will take place. So where does that leave Iron Mike Tyson? Well, if Iron Mike is as good as he thinks he is, I think he should go back to the old Jimmy Jacobs formula and fight as often as possible until his time comes. And what about the preacher now, undefeated George Foreman on the comeback trail? Well, this side tracks George a little bit, but he's still a big draw, and money has a way of making things happen. Another big heavyweight fight is coming up on April 4th between Razor Ruddock and Michael Dokes. And I know Razor Ruddock's saying to himself right now, it could have been me. I could be the world heavyweight champion right now. Well, he's the guy that really got shafted. He had the contract. The fight was supposed to take place. Then Tyson got the Tyson flu. But the rumor was he wasn't looking so good in training. And that's why he pulled out of the fight. So, yes, Ruddock certainly has to feel like he might have been the champion of the world today. And he's going to fight Michael Dokes, who I always said I wanted to see in the ring with Mike Tyson. Because Dokes has a chin of iron. He throws a lot of punches. It would have been an interesting fight. The winner of this fight can be projected all the way up there in a heavyweight division. You know, on Boxing the Sweet Science, we've often talked about the middleweights and the welterweights. We never talked about the heavyweight division because it was a foregone conclusion that anyone would lose to Tyson. Well, now it's wide open, Gil. Is it good for the sport of boxing? I think it's great for the sport of boxing. There's a lot of mind matches that can be made now. The people now know that he's not Iron Mike. He's made out of flesh and blood. A lot of action in the heavyweight division now. When we come back, we'll meet a gentleman who knows a lot about the heart and soul of Mike Tyson. His former trainer. No, not Kevin Rooney. A gentleman by the name of Teddy Atlas. Boxing the Sweet Science continues in a moment. You may have been startled by the sight of Mike Tyson crying in the arms of an unidentified man. That man was Teddy Atlas, Mike Tyson's first trainer. The story was told in Peter Heller's Bad Intentions. As Customato, realizing Mike Tyson's potential, established different rules for Tyson. The double standard offended Atlas's sense of fairness. He complained and was dismissed. Kevin Rooney came in, trained Tyson, and reaped the millions. Atlas retained his integrity and his genuine love for the sport of boxing. He has candid thoughts on Tyson making it back to the top. I think for him to get back, he's going to have to definitely research himself, search himself, and be able to change his outside life a little bit, outside of the ring, and get back to the basics as far as the disciplines of the sport. I think that as he possesses the ability to do it, one of the things, believe it or not, that I think that Mike Tyson would use as a tool and a guiding light sort of to do it would be that he's such a student of the game, I think that he would use that knowledge and the past in researching other fighters and it's a sincere part of his makeup that he really he really um, acknowledges and looks up to these these past fighters and he would I would think look at the old-time fighters the Lewis's when he, they lost at similar parts of their career and Ali and say well for them to be great they had to come back was Tyson out of shape for the fight against Buster Douglas? Did he lack motivation? Um, I would say that the chances are he probably wasn't 100% physically or mentally. Um, just, just from what his surroundings were at that time and from what his lifestyle was at that time. I don't know if that's solely the reason why he lost. Um, 
uh, a lot of it had to do with Buster Douglas being prepared and exposing him in areas that he had never been exposed. That we, we took for granted that when he was winning fights, that he was at such a level, that nobody that we didn't look at some of the flaws. But I think that uh, people that did question his place in history and that did say if he lost, where would he lose? I, where would he lose? The things that they mentioned were, it would be a guy that didn't allow himself to get intimidated a guy who if he tried some of his intimidating efforts like hitting after the bell the guy would hit him back and 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 not allow him to you know to intimidate him that way it would be a guy that wouldn't be afraid to throw the punches when the openings were there instead of other guys who were just worried about getting hit does mike tyson have a fear of failure one thing that i think has remained the same is he does fear things being taken away or uh, certain plateaus and certain things that he's reached, not not being able to stay there. I mean, let me elaborate on it. What I mean is, I remember one time in Colorado before a fight, and he was 15, and he had won the Nationals the year before Junior Olympics, all by knockout. And he was in the finals, and we were, we were outside in the um, arena, outdoors in Colorado, and we were getting ready to go in to get gloved, and he broke down and he started to cry. And he said, they all like me now. People didn't like me, now they like me. A lot of people like Mike Tyson and like to be around me. And I said, yeah, they do, and they continue liking you as long as you continue acting the way you've been acting. I, I didn't want to specify it in just boxing. And um, he said, I'm afraid if I lose, they won't like me no more. And he said this as he was crying. He says, if I lose, I'll lose all that. Teddy, you knew Mike Tyson at a time before he was successful and before he was rich. So is it fair for you to talk about a period of time many years ago when Tyson could have been a different person? Emotionally and personally, um, some of the things I think stay with you, uh, you know, uh, are formed at a certain age and a part of your character and your makeup probably throughout your life. And I think there's certain consistencies with Mike and things that are probably the same as they were when he was young. He's a sensitive person. He's a person that sometimes um, had trouble dealing with his emotions. A part of that is um, acknowledged and understood by his background. Predictions for the future. Tyson champion, Tyson in trouble, Tyson quitting. I, I remember one time that no one has talked about, and probably the reason for it is no one just knows this part of his history. There was a time when he fought a guy named Al Evans in the amateurs. It was his first senior fight, um, technically. Al Evans was a mature fighter that had been on the scene for years, and, and an older fighter, and a real veteran. He got knocked out by Al Evans. A lot of people don't realize that. So there is, there is a president for this situation at a much earlier time in his career. You've maintained your values, you've maintained your standards. Do you have any regrets? And if you had to do it all over, would you do it the same way? If I dealt with it now, maybe I'd be looking at it in, in all fairness. I, I would be looking at it in the different aspects of it. I'm saying, well, gee, I got a family, and I, you know, and there's a lot of money to be made. But I would like to think that I would do the same thing, you know? I mean, I don't know if it's uh, fair to just say that I would, but I would like to think I did, and as far as uh, that I would. And as far as um, do I regret it? No, I, because at the time of my life, it was something that I, was, uh, the, I thought was the right thing to do. Teddy Atlas, memories of Tyson, if not millions from Tyson, a trainer of conviction, a man of values. Welcome back to Boxing the Sweet Science. Certainly overshadowed by the Tyson-Douglas debacle in Tokyo was a bout between Vinny Pazienza and Hector Camacho for the WBO Junior Welterweight Championship. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. Camacho put the macho back in his act. He totally outclassed Pazienza in what may have been his best performance since the 1985 victory over Jose Luis Ramirez. Camacho scored a unanimous 12-round decision by outboxing his opponent and counterpunching with Flash. The Macho Man improved his undefeated record to 39-0.
Hector Camacho won a unanimous decision. Gil, did he look as good to you as he has in a long time? Well, you have to look good if you beat Vinny Pazienza because he has all the heart in the world. He tries. He keeps the pressure on you. So he brought out the best in Macho Camacho. Camacho entered the ring with a wild headdress, but without a doubt, once again, the Costume of the Month award goes to Jorge Paez. The ever-clowning Paez entered the ring wearing long silver trunks and supporting a Batman logo. But the fight was far from an easy caper. Paez barely scored a split decision over former kickboxing champion Troy Dorsey. Although Paez spent much of the fight on the ropes, he rallied in the final rounds to keep his featherweight belt. Dorsey earned some respect. Irish Steve Collins had the hometown fans screaming for an upset in his WBA middleweight championship fight against title holder Mike McCallum. Collins, an awkward fighter, nevertheless showed an iron chin and a strong will. Collins also showed endurance as he roared back from an early deficit to make it an exciting fight, especially in a wild sixth round at the Heinz Convention Center in Boston. But Mike McCallum, the two-time world champion, prevailed. And when we come back, Cats and Clancy will tickle your fancy. As Boxing This would like to check in with a regular contributor on Boxing This Sweet Science, Michael Katz, who has some thoughts on the state of boxing. Bruce, there's something wrong with boxing. It's called pay-per-view. It's the future of boxing, I'm told. Right now, the future looks like it's the same thing that killed Vaudeville. It's the junk bond of sports. We have on pay-per-view such wonderful events as Hector Camacho against other clowns like Ray Mancini and Vinny Pazienza. We have George Foreman and Jerry Cooney, wherever they came from. What we don't have is quality control, even the limited amount that the networks and HBO and Showtime provide. The only quality control is the lowest common denominator that promoters think they can get away with. For example, there is a good pay-per-view fight coming up in April. Razor Ruddock, Michael Dose. But Murad Muhammad, the co-promoter, says in order to make that gold pay-per-view, he's got to put on James Bone Crusher Smith and Mike Weaver, two heavyweights whose combined age is older than Gil Clancy. It's absurd. In order to make a fight, for example, like Simon Brown and Buddy McGirt, a real fine fight on pay-per-view, you'd have to put on the Bone Crusher Weaver winner against Ronaldo Snipes, I guess. The problem is, pay-per-view is too much easy money. And until the public gets wise and stops buying the George Foremans and Hector Camachos until they start fighting real opponents, then we're gonna have more of the same. We're not gonna have, as HBO is providing this month, a wonderful fight like Julio Cesar Chavez and Mildred Taylor. The first real great fight of the 90s. Not counting Buster Douglas and Mike Tyson, of course. And I gotta tell you, one of the great pay-per-view stars, a clown who stars more in his press conferences than in his fights, Hector Camacho has told me he likes Chavez, and I love his reasoning. Camacho is one of the best analysts in, in, in boxing. And what he doesn't like about Meldrick Taylor surprised me. He doesn't like Meldrick Taylor's lateral movement. Given my last view of Chavez against Sammy Fuentes, I thought I saw something very interesting. When he turns it on, as he did for very brief moments, he is still, pound for pound, the best fighter in the world. I love Chavez in that fight. It won't be easy. Thank you, Mike. Now let's check in with Gil Clancy in his corner. Uh, Buster Douglas sent shockwaves through the boxing business when he knocked out Mike Tyson. But what he almost had a negative shock, which would have been a body blow to boxing. At the end of nine rounds, unbelievably, one Japanese judge had the fight even. Another one had Mike Tyson one point ahead. If the fight would have continued and Mike Tyson's hand was raised, there would have been chaos and it would have been a shame. You know, we have to talk about these judges. Where do they get judges? What are the requirements? How do you become a judge? It's a very responsible job. Do you realize that when a fight ends and the announcer says, and the winner is, that affects a lot of people's lives. The fighter, the trainer, the manager, their families. It's a very, very responsible job. Years ago, I had a guy fight. I went down to the commission and I complained to the commission. I said, what makes this guy qualified to be a judge? The commissioner said, he says he boxed in the Navy. 
I said, well, did you get any kind of a document, a newspaper clipping? He said, no, he says he boxed in the Navy. That made him a judge. Nowadays, we have women judges, and I don't say they're any worse than the men, but what can their qualifications be? That they love boxing, they've seen a lot of fights. Every one of you could probably qualify to be a judge because you love boxing and you watch a lot of fights. But don't go down to the commission and put in an application. Let's face it, it's a political job. It's a friend of a friend. What we need is good, competent judges. The commissioner should really interview these guys. A one-hour oral examination. And after they get appointed a judge, you should police them. And if their scores are a lot different than the other guys, you have to pick them up and get them out of there. It affects the fighter's future. These fighters work very, very hard. And for an incompetent guy to take their future away with a bad score is just terrible. And that's the view from Bill, a court. unification bout in the junior welterweight ranks between Julio Cesar Chavez and Meldrick Taylor. There isn't a fight fan in the world that should miss this fight. The two most skilled fighters in the world, pound for pound, and they're fighting each other. Let's take a look at the rest of the March schedule.